As more and more third party triggers seem to be adding in extra spokes, extra cones, rim trigger platforms, muffling solutions and more, it's not that often that you see something new with a more minimalist design. Enter the oval drums triggers. These are understated, uniquely shaped 3D printed triggers that were intended to give people a simple, cheap and effective way to convert their acoustic shells into electronic drums in a reasonably non-destructive manner. So is simpler the best way? Hey, welcome back to the eDrum Workshop. I'm Luke and I hope you're having a great day. As with all reviews, full disclosure, I was very kindly sent two of these oval drum triggers a few months ago and I am able to keep them. But of course, all of the opinions in this video are my own and I wasn't asked to say anything in particular. I was sent a kick trigger for my 16 inch converted kick drum and a 13 inch two zone snare trigger. As regular viewers of the channel will know, I had to take a little bit of time out recently and as such I wasn't able to do much testing of these triggers when they first arrived. And I would love that to be the only reason that it's taken me a while to get to this review. But there have been a few other reasons that I'll get to shortly. So just as a little bit of background, Oval is a one man company and Tom, the creator of these triggers, said that he wanted to try and create a cheaper alternative to existing acoustic to electronic drum conversion. They're simple brackets that attach to one set of lug screws on your shell and they come with a quick connector cable for an external jack box. The single zone trigger simply holds a foam cone with a piezo under it and the dual zone trigger has an extra little platform off to the side lined with foam for the rim sensor. The snare and the single zone tom triggers that they make are centre cone triggers whereas the kick trigger is a side trigger with a bit of a different design. The single zone triggers come in at 30 euros and the dual zone own trigger comes in at 40 euros so these are indeed cheap triggers. All of the triggers are made to order and you can select from a few different options on the website. The single zone toms range from 8 to 18 inches, the snares are listed from 12 to 14 inches and the kicks are either 16 and 18 inches or 20 and 22 inches. However, adaptations can be made for customers on request if you've got weird sizes. When I was initially contacted, I was told that the kick drum trigger was the same design from 18 up to 24 inches. However, when I replied and let Oval know that my kick drum conversion is a 16 inch one, they tweaked the design to work for that and now it's available as an option on the website, which is really cool. And I do really like the concept behind these triggers. They're designed to be elastic rather than rigid like most triggers. The foam is also much softer than the usual trigger cone material that you tend to find and it bounces back into its original shape really quickly. The idea behind this combination is that it's supposed to reduce hot spotting due to the flexibility of the materials while still maintaining a more even edge response on the head due to it being positioned in the centre rather than off to one side. The foam can be depressed more than other triggers too. The initial guide that I was given is 15 millimeters of depression but I was told that this is just a guide and that it shouldn't really affect triggering too much. The external jack box will be a matter of taste. I'm not personally that big on them, especially when they have very exposed thin wires like this, but I do understand the idea behind their use. They're designed to be non-destructive, so mounting a jack box on the outside of the shell that can then be wired through an existing vent hole fits with this idea. You shouldn't need to remove your vent hole or make any new holes, and the closest that you're supposed to get to tampering with the drum itself is removing the heads and a couple of lug screws to install the trigger. So the idea here is that it's supposed to be simple to reverse if you do want to turn your kit back into an acoustic kit at a later date. Unfortunately, as much as I like the simplicity and the idea behind this design, the installation process didn't go as smoothly as I'd have hoped. Because of the break that I took, I actually had to install the snare trigger twice and I had very similar issues both times, so I'll start there. To begin with, despite the simple form factor, the shape actually made it a bit more difficult for me to get the screwdriver in to mount it. Initially, I was using a small but quite fat screwdriver, one that's normally perfect for the tight spaces inside drums, but the trigger brackets were exactly where I needed my screwdriver to be in order to tighten the screws. More recently, I've found that a more 
much longer screwdriver that came with my new toolbox fits much better. I still had to kind of press it right up against the trigger itself to do this, which did feel a bit like I was going to break it, but it is supposed to be flexible so I was hoping that that wouldn't be a problem. So basically you need the right size tool going in, otherwise you might run into issues. The next problems that I ran into were with the connections and the external jack box. The cables for the connections are quite short so you end up quite limited in where you can position the trigger in relation to your vent hole. This isn't a major gripe but it is something that I had to consider. Then I had problems getting the wire through the vent hole on my snare. The quick connector that's used is quite wide but it should be able to fit through most standard vent holes. However because I've converted this 13 inch drum backwards and forwards between electronic and acoustic many times over the years, I actually removed the original vent hole long ago and I've since replaced it with an aftermarket screw on one. This hole is a lot narrower and that quick connector just wouldn't fit through it. So again this is just something to consider if your drum has a non-standard vent on it. To get around this I took the vent out entirely and just left the hole uncovered which is fine for the purpose of a review but I probably wouldn't want to leave it like this permanently. And finally the jack box itself mounts to the shell using double sided tape. I made sure to wipe down the shell beforehand to get rid of any debris but unfortunately after I connected and disconnected the jack a few times the jack box just came off the shell entirely and it wasn't very sticky again after that. I relayed some of these issues back to Oval and I got a little bit more insight into some of these choices. Obviously the vent hole thing is pretty situational and these connectors will fit through the majority of standard vent holes. A smaller connector can be supplied on request for the single zone triggers but unfortunately the dual zone ones because they've got three cables need to use these wider connectors. Other trigger companies have used things like mini jack cables to great effect for this use. However with this being a more low cost solution that would add more onto the price and it would also require a change in design for something that's not really going to affect the majority of users so I can kind of understand why it's not that way for now. The double sided tape that was chosen was apparently chosen due to both a mixture of its strength and also its ability to not leave marks on the shell of your drum. This seems to be quite a large part of the philosophy behind these triggers. The idea that you can use these on a high end acoustic kit without any damage is definitely a good one. There's also an additional piece of information that I wasn't privy to going in. The adhesive will only be at full strength if you leave it on for a few hours before you use it. It does make me wonder though how well this would hold up to swapping between acoustic and electronic setups more than once. I actually ended up replacing the tape with my own much stronger tape because I'm not really too precious about this drum and the potential for damage to its finish. There have also been some extra options added to the order pages on the website since I first looked. You can get a cable extension for the kick drum and there's also an option of a pre-soldered jack for drilled drums. So it is really promising to see that these kinds of design changes are being implemented as the feedback comes back to them. So that was a lot about the build and the installation but how does the dual zone snare trigger actually perform? Unfortunately I've struggled with it. The first issue that I was running into on my initial installation was that I was getting rim triggers on the head with anything other than a really light hit. The first things that I'll usually check with issues like this are the cables and the trigger itself and I did actually spot something that I'd done wrong. I'd connected up the quick connector so that the wires were matched up the wrong way. So optimistically I thought that clearly must have been the issue, but unfortunately it didn't seem to make any noticeable difference. On my second installation I actually had more time to troubleshoot so I tried a bunch of other presets on my now upgraded TD50X module and I found that I was only getting this rim and head issue on the center cone presets. I did wonder whether maybe the positional sensing was causing this but I tried turning the positional sensing off and it still did it. When I swapped the preset over to a side trigger preset like the PDX8, the PDX12 or the Pad2 preset I didn't have this issue anymore so I was getting the correct assignments on both the head and the rim and I was also getting very good separation between the rim and the head hits.
However, I also got some pretty incredible hot spotting, like really big jumps up to the maximum velocity. Weirdly, this wasn't really happening on any lighter hits. If I played lightly all across the head, the hot spotting was really minimal. However, as soon as I went anywhere near the middle of my dynamic range, I was getting big jumps straight up to maximum velocity. And to compound this issue, I was also getting extra triggers after hard hits in the centre. Unfortunately, this made the trigger practically unplayable. While I was testing things out, I was sort of adapting to it and kind of playing around it, but as soon as I tried to play naturally, it was really erratic. I did manage to dial out the extra hits with the re-trigger cancel settings. Normally I'd be reaching for the mask time for this, but it seemed a bit too severe and the re-trigger is the one that did the best job. So that was one problem solved, but unfortunately I just couldn't dial out the hotspot. Using one of the curves to bring the ghost notes up wasn't really closing the gap enough, and all it was really doing was slightly changing the severity of the issue. And bringing down the sensitivity was only making it more difficult to hit the higher dynamics anywhere but the centre of the head. None of my attempts at balancing these two things out was enough to close that big gap. So I spoke to Tom from Oval, and he did tell me that I'm one of the few people that are using this trigger on a higher end module, but these issues, especially the hotspot, hadn't really come up before. I really wanted to make sure that I'd tried every single angle possible before making this review. So I asked him about things like the foam height in case that was just user error and I was just making an obvious mistake. But like I said before, I was told that typically speaking, the foam cone depression shouldn't really affect the triggering that much. I did recall that back when the TD50 first came out, a few DIYers were having similar issues with the rim triggering on the head, but unfortunately I don't have any previous generation roller modules to try this trigger out on. However, I did try it out on my other modules. I didn't get the rim head issue at all on the TD17 or the Pearl Mimic Pro, which makes sense because their trigger engines don't need to consider the wiring for positional sensing. The TD27, however, gave me the exact same results as the TD50, and unfortunately that big spiking hot spot and those initial extra triggers that I get without the re-trigger cancel were present on every module that I tried. I did also initially wonder whether maybe the three-ply spare drum head that I had installed on this snare was causing a problem. Maybe the loose bottom ply was interacting weirdly with the softer foam cone material. So I did test this out with a 13-inch Roland power ply, two-ply head, just to test the theory. I did notice that the foam didn't seem quite as depressed with the Roland head on. I'm not sure whether that's due to the thickness or whether it's just the way that it sits on the bearing edge, so I did try out a couple of different trigger heights with this head. For all intents and purposes, I was getting practically the same results either way. I did also try bringing the trigger right down so that it was only just touching the mesh head. However, when I did that, I actually completely lost the lowest velocities and I was still getting hot spots between medium and hard. And then when I went back in to try and adjust the height again, I spotted this.
So while the trigger was still intact, I did try everything that I could think of. The solutions that usually work, the ones that don't work just in case, but unfortunately I just couldn't get reliable triggering out of the snare trigger. Now the issue with mine breaking has apparently already been resolved so I'll touch on that a bit more towards the end. The kick drum trigger performance however has been the complete opposite experience. Yeah. The installation was still a little bit fiddly. You still need to have the right shaped screwdriver to really get in there. I also had to remove the platform and foam cylinder that I've got installed in my kit conversion due to the shape of the oval trigger. I would have had to squash it in right between the platform and the shell which would have sort of defeated the point of the flexibility and possibly even given me weird vibration transfers. If I wanted to keep this trigger installed permanently I could definitely work around it by changing the platform but I was happy to test this without the foam cushion installed. And this definitely won't be an issue for the majority of people, this is very much to do with the way that I've built my own DIY kick. I also didn't want to remove my own DIY trigger because it's properly wired into the barrel jack. However that was fine because there's a vent hole up at the top of the drum, so I just installed the oval trigger up there out of the way. And I wouldn't really want the jack box permanently up there, but for the purposes of this review that was fine. I actually left the adhesive to set this time around and it's held up a lot better than the snare one did, so that was clearly a pretty necessary step. In practice the kick trigger has performed really well right off the bat. The settings that I already had for my own kick trigger worked really well but I just had to bring the sensitivity down. And it performs exactly how you would expect a side mounted kick trigger to perform. And double pedal work was coming out very consistently too. Because it's installed slightly off centre it's maybe a fraction weighted towards the right pedal but it hasn't actually proven to be a problem at all while I've been playing. So I would definitely recommend giving the oval kick drum trigger a shot if you're looking for a low cost AOE solution for your bass drum. Slightly awkward installation of the bracket and external jack box aside, I don't really have anything to fault it on. You'll know whether these are things that you want to avoid or not and if you value turning your kick drum back into an acoustic one with relative ease then this would probably be a pretty good solution for you. The snare trigger though, unfortunately from my experience I can't recommend it. I really hate doing negative reviews especially when it comes to small independent companies. I really did want to get this to work well but I just couldn't resolve the issues that I was having with it. I wasn't getting any of the intended hotspot reduction and in fact it was probably one of the most problematic hotspots that I've had to deal with. Add that to the fact that I couldn't even get positional sensing out of it due to the rim and head trigger problem and that's basically all of the disadvantages of a centre cone trigger and none of the advantages. Tom from Oval did explain to me that the positional sensing wasn't really on his radar when making these choices and this does make sense with it being a lower cost solution aimed at people who were probably running modules that don't support it and he was very active in all of the support that he gave me while I was trying to troubleshoot the trigger. He's actually already done many tweaks and iterations of his design since he sent my trigger out. As I mentioned before where mine broke has already been addressed since my model was sent. Apparently it was a printing issue due to the temperature in his workshop. He's also told me that he's very willing to be flexible with his warranties. So that kind of customer service coupled with the continued commitment to tweak and revise designs as necessary I think is a really positive thing to see. Hopefully any other issues that I've encountered can be ironed out and I'm definitely interested to see what Oval will produce in the future. If you enjoy this review please pop a- ah see you later battery. If you enjoyed this review please pop a like on the video, subscribe to the channel for more and if you want new kits or samples for your electronic drum module don't forget to check out my store at theedrumworkshop.com. But above all enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you in the next video, if my camera's working, cheers!